Welcome to Cayman Turtle Center. A day of fun and adventure awaits at Cayman Turtle Center Island Wildlife Encounter. Swim and snorkel alongside sea turtles and other marine life. Meet tropical birds in the Avery, ride a turtle twister water slide, or simply relax by the lagoon. Plan your adventure today. Visit us online at www.turtle.ky. Hello everyone and welcome to the green scene. My name is Shona McGill and I'm an education programs officer at the Cayman Turtle Conservation and Education Center. With me this morning, I have two guests and I'll let them both introduce themselves. The first one, if you've listened to any of our talks before, you'll probably know this gentleman. His name is Mr. Geddes Hislop, but I'll let him introduce himself. Hello guys, welcome to the green scene. I'm Geddes Hislop, I'm the curator for terrestrial programs, and terrestrial exhibits and education programs at the Cayman Turtle Center. And we also have with us Jane from the Department of Environment. Yes, thank you so much <laughs> for having me here today. I am Jane Hokanson, and I do work at the Department of Environment as a Terrestrial Resources Officer. Um, and I've been here for almost 15 years now. And we're excited to bring you another episode of The Green Scene today. And we hope that you'll tune in every single Saturday at 11 a.m. here on Bobo 89.1 FM as we talk all about conservation, wildlife, and more. In each episode, we'll be exploring topics relating to conservation here in the Cayman Islands, including protecting our natural environment and preserving our culture and heritage, as well as talking all about sea turtles and other native species. And speaking of other native species, on today's show, we'll be talking all about parrots. We'll begin by talking about the importance of the parrots to the Cayman Islands and their significance and highlighting unique characteristics and the role they play in our environment here in the Cayman Islands. And then we'll then go into the different species and talk about the different conservation programs we have for them here. Jane, I'll let you begin by telling us about the species of parrots that we have here in the Cayman Islands. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> yes, I think we, uh, we, we do um, cherish our parrots very much when we see them. And actually, there are two uh, different kinds here. So we have the Grand Cayman parrot on Grand Cayman, and then we have the Cayman brack parrot on Cayman brack. And actually, the Cayman brack parrot also used to inhabit Little Cayman before the big storm in the 1940s, um, where they lost a lot of their habitat there. So now they're restricted to Cayman brack. So, so there's actually two different kinds of, of the Amazons here. And they're definitely an iconic species here in the Cayman Islands. If you guys have seen the Bobo FM, that is the Cayman parrot on there. That's true. Um, <laughs> and at Cayman Turtle Center, we actually have the two species of Cayman parrots, don't we, Gettys? Yes, we do. Uh, the two subspecies are, as Jane said, they're restricted to their respective islands. Because as most people may or may not know, parrots don't mig they're not very good migration migrators. Migrators, I guess that's a word. <laughs> they don't migrate very well. That's as far as I know, they can only make maybe go about maybe 30 or 40 miles in a long stretch. And since the islands are over 70 miles apart, they're not crossing on their own. Interesting thing is that if you can go a little more general, you talk about parrots throughout the Caribbean. All island Amazons are iconic species because they're all restricted and unique to their own islands. And in the Caribbean, if you extend it fully and include the Bahamas, there are 13 species of, of what we call the Amazon parrots. Right, what they call the true parrots. And out of those 13 species, four of them are national birds of their respective countries. So apart from the Cayman Islands, we also have St. Lucia and Dominica. Both have parrots as their national birds. And both those parrots, just like the Cayman Islands, are unique to those islands only. And the, all parrots are special because they play a cultural role. Most people know about them as a, on the pet trade. You know, most people talk about Polly. The amount of times I heard people say Polly want a cracker. <laughs> Right? But they're more than just that. Right? It's the, especially in the Cayman Islands, uh, one thing I can say right away, and just to make a personal note, following Hurricane Ivan in 2004, one of the first things that I saw, well, second thing that I saw flying was a Cayman parrot. And that was just a rush of relief to see that after all that devastation, to see that flash of color out there. It just gave you a little bit of hope. That things could be all right. If a parrot can survive and make it there, you know, things could come back, and they have. And you also joke that they were the first national flag carrier of the yes, Cayman Islands. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's another thing. Most people, well, as we get further down into it, uh, most people don't realize when school kids come to visit Turtle Center and you talk about the parrots, and I tell them, do you know that the Cayman parrots have all the colors of the national flag? And yeah, that makes them the original national flag carrier. No disrespect to Cayman Airways. 
Now, I'm sure some people might be wondering how you tell the difference between the two species, the Grand Cayman and the Cayman Brac parrot. So Jane, how could you tell the difference between the two? Yes, it's a very good question, especially when you see one in isolation, um, especially if it's a caged bird and, and you're not um, sure which island it's coming from. But generally speaking, you can both uh, tell the difference from the way they look, but especially also the way that they sound. And uh, the way they look different is that the Brack parrot is generally a little bit smaller and a little bit uh, stuckier. And they also have a much uh, more pronounced white forehead. So you'll see that for the Grand Cayman parrot. But when you compare it, um, as you can at the Turtle Center, you can see them side by side and it's <laughs> a little easier. Um, you can see that the Cayman Brack parrot has uh, a much wider, brighter forehead. Um, and then they also sound very different, which is, uh, I'm not going to imitate a parrot here. <laughs> <laughs> you, no. You're going to give it a go, get it? No. no. <laughs> so they sound a lot harsher, right? Is that a way yeah. of describing yeah. it? It's, uh, harsher. And they have di a different range of calls. And, and that's something that's known to parrots, that they actually, even within the same uh, subspecies, if you have bigger islands like Costa Rica, for example, um, sorry, uh, Puerto Rico, you will have um, different dialects depending on where you are. So a friend of mine has actually studied dialects in the Puerto Rican parrot, which is, of course, the last American parrot um, to, to be alive. And uh, it's, it's really interesting. So it's clear that the Brackers and the Grand Cayman mm -hmm. birds, they speak <laughs> speak very differently. Yeah, just like the people. Yeah, yeah, it's like us with the different um, accents that we have, too, between Grand Cayman and Cayman Brack as well. Now, even though they look slightly different to one another, do they share the same behaviors? Like, this, do they eat the same food or nest the same way? Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. Uh, I think on the BRAC, there might not be quite the same variety as there is on, on Bigger Island, Grand Cayman. But yeah, they, generally they eat the same thing. And uh, I should mention that, that uh, parrots are also, by that, very, by that very habit that they have of eating, what I tend to see is parrots are messy eaters. In the wild, and I do a lot of bird watching, and you know, I know Jane does too, one of the ways that two ways to find parrots. One is you hear them, and the other, one, the other one is you hear their feeding because they're messy eaters, they drop a lot of things. So you hear things falling in the forest from the trees, very likely there's a parrot up there. And that makes them seed dispersers, especially for large heavy fruits like almonds and uh, mahogany. So there's not many other animals that can disperse big heavy fruits. And parrots, are, parrots are one of those few, especially in, our, in the Cayman ecosystem. So they're also important for the health of the forest, even though they some people consider them seed predators in the sense that they destroy the, the fruits, but the majority of the time they don't actually eat the whole fruit, much to the dismay of some farmers. Now, when you say they're a seed disperser, for someone who might know exactly, not know exactly what that means, what does that mean? Uh, it them? means that they, they transport seeds of plants from one area to another. Most plants, if they fall close to the parent tree, they're overwhelmed by the parent tree because there's lots of shade, usually there's lots of shade and the tree itself is a, is established and taking up the nutrients in the soil and enter it. But if you can get that, that seed, that seed or seedling or fruit far away from the tree and a chance where there's you know, an open area and less competition, it has a better chance of spreading. So the health of our forest depends on a lot of seed dispersers, things like white crown pigeons, uh, even blue iguanas are seed dispersers because they carry the seeds far and disperse them far and wide. You know, it's just like if it's like long ago when they, used to, when they used to sow fields, they would scatter seeds. It's the same concept. And since we're not the ones climbing the trees and shaking down the fruits and carrying them around, the wildlife that does it, they're, very, they're a part of the forest ecosystem. And, or, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, and, and no. some of, I was about to say, some of the seeds too do depend on being digested as well by some of yeah. our endemic animals. Endemic meaning that these animals are found nowhere else in the world. And so, especially for iguanas, we know that some of the endemic plant species need to be digested or they um, sprout and, and grow much better once they have gone through the digestive system of the, of the blue iguana. Yeah. It's very cool. <laughs> it is. And why would you say the Cayman parrot is so important to us here in the Cayman Islands? Well, I can speak to the cultural social side of it. Uh, parrots are, for a long time, around the, in, well, wherever parrots are, they've been considered pets. Everybody, most people know about parrots being able to talk, or rather mimic is probably a better word. And they're very intelligent, long-lived birds. So they, they make really good pets if you keep them right. But here in the Cayman Islands, you know, when people settled these islands, there wasn't much to do way back when. Before we had things like Commander Bay and WhatsApp and traffic, you know, Netflix. Netflix. <laughs> you know, people had to entertain themselves somehow, so they, and there was a, an abundance of parrots at the time. 
So people kept them as pets and they make really good companions. So yeah, there's a social side to it. Uh, the other side of it is uh, in modern times, people, people that are into nature and, and bird watching, for example, there are people that actually visit this island specifically to see our parrots. Because Cayman, these are small islands isolated out in the middle of the ocean, and they have un- what they have here is unique, and the world comes to us anyway. So people come here to see to see parrots and other things that are unique to the Cayman Islands. And then the parrots themselves, just the sounds of nature, one of the iconic sounds of nature early in the morning is to hear the parrots. Some people that might not be so harsh, especially if you're trying, to, trying not to wake up early, but you know, the sound of parrots out there is, is an, iconic, it's an iconic sound of nature here in the Cayman Islands. And it's... It might be harsh to some people, but it's also something that helps you connect with nature. What do you think, Jane? Anything? Well, I'd rather be woken up by a parrot than a rooster. That's (laughs) that's for sure. Um, But I I do think, too, that as the world is getting smaller in the sense that we are more able to travel and visit other places, I think it's becoming clearer that we are extremely lucky with the natural resources that we have here. It's very... uh, it's very rare that you can see a big, beautiful, colorful bird like our Cayman parrots in any other place, really. Even if there is a resident parrot population and, and where you're visiting, you're lucky enough that that's the case. You rarely see them because parrots are extremely threatened um, across their ranges just due to habitat destruction, uh, development and um, feral animals like cats and dogs. So. So as we are visiting all of these other places in the world, it's it's clear that we are so very lucky to still have healthy parrot populations here, I think. Definitely. And were our parrots recently downgraded to endangered or no? No. The, their no. status hasn't changed because, um, unfortunately, we are grouped under the Cuban parrot complex. Okay. So while they are actually quite different, and they are different subspecies um, to to each other, the the Cayman parrots, the Grand Cayman parrot and the... And the came a brack parrot are classed under the Cuban parrot and that's if if anyone's interested we we published a paper a couple of years ago trying to adopt local um, uh, statuses instead of the overall IUCN status Mm -hmm. because when you suddenly start lumping us in with Cuba obviously um, it may look like they're doing much better than they actually are and and given the fact that we have such small ranges on the island our parrots uh, regardless of how many we have here will always uh, be threatened and and critically endangered due to uh, the small size of the habitat remaining. And what are the estimations on the numbers of both species currently? So we have actually just done our parrot survey this year. We usually do it pre-reproductive period, so so at the beginning of, of the year. And uh, we're still analyzing those, res- those um, data. But we usually say we have around 600 breeding pairs on Grand Cayman and only about 60 breeding pairs on Cayman Brac. That's the sort of, the, it goes up and down and especially down with storms. So in the 2000 and, was it nine? Um, when we had Paloma and oh, Cayman Brack, mm-hmm. yes, we um, 2008. That's right. We uh, we lost half the the population of the Cayman Brack po- um, parrots, and so that gives you an idea that if we have two consecutive storms or two stochastic events, you know, consecutively, we could very well be losing the the Cayman Brack subspecies. So so definitely, they're not going to be downgraded um, anytime yeah. soon because um, the risk of extinction for both populations, but especially the Brack population, is very real. And an example of that is the Abaco parrot in the Bahamas with the hurric- one of their more recent hurricanes. Absolutely. Right? And, and interestingly, I was going to mention that earlier <laughs> when you asked about the, the habits yeah. of, the, of our species, subspecies, compared to each other, because the Abaco uh, parrot actually is a ground nesting bird. So if you know a bit about ours, they nest in cavities inside of trees. They need hollowed out trees often. They use woodpecker holes and, and that sort of thing. But the Abaco parrot, I was very lucky to go and help the Bahamas National Trust do their parrot survey uh, eight years ago or something. And they nest on the ground. And it's just the most crazy the thing, thing to to witness <laughs> parrots on the ground. You know, you never see that unless you had a storm or they're really desperate. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, they, they nest in, in little rock holes and crevices. And, and so, oh. of course, the threat of cats and, and mm-hmm. other uh, predators is, is really crazy there. But, but that was wild to see. Very interesting. So different. Oh. I can't wrap my mind around that. No, I know. <laughs> and that would also prove a threat in hurricanes for storm surge, too, if you nest True, on the ground. True, absolutely. As Flooding would be detrimental uh, during the, the nesting season, absolutely. Okay, well, thank you so much, you two. I think we're going to head to a break before we come back for our second segment where we're going to talk about the conservation and the threats that face the Cayman parrots here in the Cayman Islands. So stick around, and we'll be back with you soon. Welcome to Cayman Turtle Center. A day of fun and adventure awaits at Cayman Turtle Center Island Wildlife Encounter. 
Swim and snorkel alongside sea turtles and other marine life. Meet tropical birds in the Avery, ride our turtle twister water slide, or simply relax by the lagoon. Plan your adventure today. Visit us online at www.turtle.ky. Hello, my name is Coco. I'm a Cayman Parrot at the Cayman Turtle Center. I was rescued and love my home here. Did you know our human friends at the center breed and raise Cayman Parrots? The national bird of the Cayman Islands? Then release them to live in the wild? Come visit me and my bird friends at Cayman Turtle Center. Did you know that turtles play an important role in ocean ecosystems? Turtles maintain healthy seagrass beds and coral reefs, providing key habitat for other marine life and helping to balance marine food webs and nutrient cycling. Learn more about our turtle friends at the Cayman Turtle Center. Okay, everyone, welcome back to the green scene here on Bobo 89.1 FM. As mentioned before, I'm joined here today with Mr. Geddes and Miss Jane, and we've been talking about the Cayman parrots and their importance to the Cayman Islands. But right now, I want to touch upon what threats there might be for the Cayman parrots here in the Cayman Islands. So, Jane, if you can elaborate on that for us, please. Yes, and unfortunately, I, I can. There is a there is a lot of threats to them. Um, just as we mentioned before, they have a very small range, and they are different subspecies on Grand Cayman and Cayman Brac. So, just by virtue of them having such a small island to live on, um, means that there is not a lot of them. That just simply can't be. Um, so, they are not as resilient as other populations of parrots. And given what we know about the development and the, especially the recent development in the last couple of decades of, of all the islands, really, um, you know, they are losing their habitat really quite fast. And so the parrots, they like the big trees that have a circumference, big and, and tall, fat enough for them to crawl into and down. So that's what they're nesting in. And um, and unfortunately, those big trees are just, you know, not, not that plentiful anymore. Mm -hmm. So development and habitat loss, I would say, is, is definitely a contributing uh, factor to to a potential decline in, in the future. And um, also we have, of course, things like accidental take. So there is a lot of cars on the roads, as we all know, every day. And especially during breeding season, they will swoop down quite low and a lot of them get hit by cars. A lot, unfortunately, also get taken by cats and dogs and, and feral cats and feral dogs. Um, and then we have uh, an interesting problem insofar as that the Cayman parrot is loved and hated at the same time. So it's a really interesting conundrum from a conservation perspective. So they're loved so much that they're kept in cages as a, a cultural practice, as Geddes men mentioned earlier. But they're also hated because they take mangoes and take a bite out of them and drop them on the ground. So still persecuted um, by farmers. And um, so, so those are kind of the four major um, threats, really, I would, I would say. So the incidentals, the the habitat loss and the, the poaching and the and the farming um, conflict and and those are of course all things that we're trying to address at, at the Department of Environment. Mm -hmm. And can you once again remind us of the numbers of parrots that we estimate? Yes, we say roughly around 600 breeding pairs on Grand Cayman and 60 on Cayman Brac. Um, it fluctuates depending on whether or not we had big storms. In Grace, for example, a few years back, we know we lost a lot of fledglings because it was right at that critical time when they're trying their wings for the first time. And, and that's that's hard for a Cayman parrot on Grand Cayman. Mm -hmm. When you look into the sky, it's a spider web of... Um, of wires and telephone posts and everything. So when you have, you're trying your wings for the first time and you have big storms, we just found so many injured birds underneath all of the mm -hmm. wires. So um, especially storms uh, can, can really cause a, a big decrease. So with such small pair numbers, you would expect that the conservation of these species is very important to their survival survivability mm -hmm. sorry of these animals yes absolutely <laughs> and and now that i was just mentioning stochastic events i should say the fifth and of course overarching threat is climate change <laughs> yeah. giving given our very low-lying islands as well so Geddes, can you just walk us through the conservation programs that we have at cayman turtle center for the cayman parrot yeah sure uh, i guess i should start with a little bit of history to store the parrots uh long ago people might remember the original cayman turtle farm in the 80s, early 90s, as having a, a sort of a zoo over on the other side with some parrots. And we should mention, actually, that uh, what's, what's critical to this is that the Cayman parrot was only declared a national bird in 1997. People kept them as pets. Its national bird status came in, in early, late 1997. When I joined the center in 2005, I inherited four parrots from the original Cayman Turtle Farm Zoo when they relocated to the new facility at the Cayman Turtle Center. Knew nothing about Cayman parrots. I just knew what they were. 
didn't even know they were two, two, two separate species, subspecies. We put those parrots into the aviary. We learned very quickly. All the things <laughs> that we learned about parrots, we learned very quickly on the, fl on the fly. No pun okay. intended. So, <laughs> ah, yes. So first thing we knew that parrots are pruners of the forest. So we put them inside our nice new aviary and they started chewing on the trees. <laughs> so in the wild, that's a healthy thing for the forest. You know, if you're with limited, limited trees, that's not such a good thing. Second thing we learned really quickly is that parrots have their own personalities. And even though they, they move around in a flock and they're, they're very sociable together, they do have their own personalities. So they very quickly try to establish zones inside there. Uh, and then in, this was in 2005, in 2008, we got, a, we got our first rescued parrot. Because uh, at the aviary there, we have our staff was trained, you know, trained keepers. So we knew a little bit, of, we did some rehabilitation training and so on. So when we got an injured parrot through the National Trust, uh, we brought it in and we said, okay, we'll keep it with the other parrots so we'll have some companionship. It turned out it was a female. We did not know how to identify a female, but we found her really quickly because all the males started to fight over her. <laughs> right? Because it was just on, it's just on the start of breeding season. And that female was named Sweet Pea. Eventually, to pick a long story short, she paired with one, of the, with one of the males. And what we found was they bonded, really, they bonded really well, and they were giving all these breeding behavior signals. So we figured, okay, well, let's see what happens if they do breed. So as Jane mentioned earlier, parrots need hollow trees. So they need old growth forests because that's where you can find a lot of old trees with natural cavities. And so we made a hollow tree for them. It took a little while to figure it out, but they actually need a certain depth and volume of, of space to breed in. So after a few tries, we figured out the right one and they started to breed. And that's when our parrot breeding program came about. Can't, everything, like I said, happened by default. But we, re, we tried to record everything and try to keep it as scientific as we could. And today we've released so far about 17 parrots into the wild. But these are slow breeding animals, uh, just to... to to complement what Jane said, there are very few, there's a limited number of breeding pairs because I think the rest of them, people might see a lot of parrots, but not all of them are breeding. It's kind of like our turtles. When we release turtles into the wild, people might see, think they see a lot of turtles, but not all of them are breeding turtles. Mm -hmm. The rest of them, I think you call them floaters. Floaters, yeah. And yeah. then some parrot populations have up to 70% floaters. Um, and that also depends on the nesting resources available. Yeah. So if you don't have a lot of nesting resources, <laughs> they, they fight, they're very territorial. Mm -hmm. Um, and you'll have a very large percentage of birds around that are not actually contributing to the resilience of the population. Yeah. So particularly following Hurricane Ivan, we decided, well, we're going to push this thing into, into high gear and see what we can do. And we started producing babies. Uh, the interesting thing is that parrots tend to be very slow breeders, slow recruiters. They don't normally have more than maybe two on average, sometimes just one. But uh, in our program, we've been able to get three birds few times and came out with a finally came out with a whole program as to how we reintroduce them into the wild and everything and that worked out really well uh, we do unfortunately we don't have a way of tracking them because uh, satellite tracking for birds is fairly expensive but through tagging and reports we've had we know that the parrots are out there most of them are being released at the botanic park and the people at botanic park keep telling every time i go in there they say yeah i see your parrots <laughs> because they can see the bands you know? mm -hmm is good so they're, they're breeding and they're coming back okay. so we like to think that our little program we call it a Noah's Ark program because we release them one by one two by two it might be a little drop in the bucket but if you release some females out there maybe they have a chance of becoming breeders themselves and when you mention bands what are you referring to when oh, you say bands? bands yeah we, all the birds that we release in our breeding program at, at the turtle center we we ban them uh partly because of permit our permits is we have a permit for the, to keep the protected birds because parrots are a protected species. So we have to have a permit under the national conservation law to keep them, even though we're a government, but we have to follow the rules more than anybody else. And also by banding them, these are what you call closed bands, which means you have to put them on when they're chick in the nest. And that is a, a sort of a validation that they were captive bred and not taken from the wild. I should mention we, we don't necessarily do rehabilitation. Uh, I mean, we help out if we can, but rehabilitation part, birds is, a little, is hard work. It's a lot of work. We've done it before, and we help out as much as we can. But if we didn't have to, we prefer not to. <laughs> it does take up a lot of time. It does. <laughs> so that's us talking about the conservation that we're doing with our own captive 
parrot population. But Jane, what is the conservation like for the wild parrots here in the Cayman Islands? It is, um, it is multifaceted and, and complicated, um, as you can probably imagine, given the threats that I, I told you about earlier, the, the four or five main threats, and, and kind of if we can, uh, I can go through the, the individual threats. Obviously, when I, I talk about climate change, we have various um, things that we have signed up to as a nation um, for, for sort of global change um, that I'm not so involved with. I'm more of a hands-on sort of uh, local project manager for the parrots here um, from a DOE perspective. And in terms of uh, habitat protection, you know, we have the uh, the TPA, the Terrestrial Protected Areas uh, Regulations under the National Conservation Law uh, Act, sorry. And we try to nominate areas that have a certain density of Cayman parrot nesting, especially when we're talking black mangrove nests. As we know, we don't have a lot of man mangroves left on the western side of the island. So we're trying to nominate pockets of where the, there's sort of extra bang for your buck in terms of the, res of the resilience of the species on, on both islands. So habitat protection is definitely one. Another thing that we have done in, when did I do the amnesty? Was that 18 and 19, I think? 19. 19 yeah. 20. So we, it's something that the department's been wanting to do for multiple decades, but we managed to complete the amnesty in 2019, which was a six month period for everybody who had a Cayman parrot to register it, make it a legal bird. And uh, I went out into, I think over 300 households and uh, <laughs> grabbed a lot of pollies <laughs> and, uh, and we gave them a health check and we did things like filing of the nails. We have a lot of issues with birds in captivity. As Ged has mentioned earlier, it's, it's not an easy job to mm -hmm. take care of these guys they have a mental age of a four-year-old child so they're extremely intelligent and and they will they will need stimuli before they they get uh, ill health and so we had a, a vet out and did a rig rigorous health checks on everything and we also microchipped and banded the birds but these are, are not the close bands that Geddes was talking about but ones that you can close um, around an adult leg and everything is uniquely numbered and that will then be on the um, on the, the permit under the National Conservation Act. So that was a really big step in parrot conservation for the Cayman Islands because now, of course, we can um, see what is a legal bird and what is an illegal bird, who has uh, been taken from the wild and, you know, who is a, a registered uh, Cayman parrot. And that means that we can actually confiscate birds that have been taken illegally and we can also um, prosecute when birds are being taken from the wild because obviously that is not a sustainable practice. So the, the amnesty was a big step in terms of conservation management. Um, and then, of course, we, we also have, and we'll probably talk about that a little bit later on, but we've established a collaboration um, with the Parrot Sanctuary. Uh, me and Geddes were heavily involved in, in setting that up with, with Ron and, and his team. And as of Friday coming, <laughs> we will have released uh, 43 Cayman parrots that have all been injured through road uh, cra uh, crashes with cars, as well as cats and, um, and dogs that have taken parrots that have been called in and, and they've been successfully rehabbed. And so that's a, a really big, that's a really big effort <laughs> right there, because that's only been going since 2019, the sanctuary. Yeah. Yeah. It was late 18. And, uh, and currently we have 19 in, in captivity out there. Some of them with broken wings that can never fly again, but they have been offered the, the best care and also serve as flagship for, for the rest of their kind. It's like a bittersweet congratulations on that because you wish they didn't get hurt in the first place. But it is Absolutely. Great, but, uh, they were but, but to be honest with you, in my decade uh, at, at the department, you know, usually I took in those parents mm -hmm. on my porch because we didn't have anywhere else. As Geddes says, it's, it's extremely difficult and time consuming. And, and it, was, it, was, it was really too much to, to try and do that as a single mm -hmm. individual. So having, being able to keep 20 parrots in amazing aviaries and giving them the chance to fly in a flight cage and uh, having staff that collects wild food for them every day. Mm -hmm. Honestly, it's, it's just, yeah, it, it's really nice to, to have accomplished that between us. It, it's great, the husbandry that can be provided to them now. Absolutely. Um, in that setting. Now, if someone, say, did find an injured parrot and they wanted to contact and get it some help to rescue it, what would they have to do in that instance? Um, I would recommend calling the Department of Environment um, and give us a call. And obviously, we have um, we actually have a, an account with the Island Veterinary Services. So we always take the Cayman parrots there first so that they can get x-rayed or they can get pain meds. You know, but parrots usually are not very happy to be very close to people while parrots. And, and so they're obviously, once they're picked up in, in distress and, and so... 
um, they can bite and they can scratch. So if you're not comfortable picking it up, make sure that you call the Department of Environment and we can um, certainly take it to the island vet. And then everything is case by case basis. Um, if, if an animal will not have um, fulfilling healthy life in captivity, um, then the animal will be put down. But we try the, our best to give every single bird the best chance possible of getting back out into the wild. Now, I know us at Cayman Turtle Center, we occasionally get calls to rescue parrots, but Geddes, can you just clarify the situation of us and our role with, that we do not have with wild parrots? Yeah, well, in general, wild animals, we, our biosecurity protocols prevent us from picking up any animal that's not part of our, our, our current collection. All the animals at the Turtle Center have a, a health program that they're undergoing, and they're I mean, the, basically, they, what we don't want to do is introduce any outside pathogens into our population. We do, we will help, we will help as much as we can. Uh, we do get calls from the public about, about injured animals, and we would, give, we, we would happily give advice. Sometimes people have dumped animals at our door, and in that case, we would contact the Department of Environment, or mm -hmm. if it's a case where we can do something for the animal without having to bring it into the facility, we will. Uh, like for example, just to give you an example of a story, we had somebody that drove up to the back gate at the aviary and had a parrot in a box and just handed it to us saying, oh yeah, I found this on the road, bye. So that poor bird had to live outside, away from our, the rest of our population. Fortunately, our, our vet was able to treat it and we, kept, we managed to keep it for a couple of days and it was releasable. But generally what we would, what we would do is, first thing is contact the Department of Environment and and, uh, and let them take it to the sanctuary or do what they have to do. Uh, that being said, uh, we try to work very closely because in, in the end, we're all looking, going for the same goal. Right? We're conserv we want to try to do conservation of species. And if we can help in any way, in any way, other way we can, we, we will. Yeah, so we'll get into the partnership with Department of Environment in a little bit, but I am afraid that we're going to have to take another break. So we'll see you guys when we get back. Welcome to Cayman Turtle Center. A day of fun and adventure awaits at Cayman Turtle Center Island Wildlife Encounter. Swim and snorkel alongside sea turtles and other marine life. Meet tropical birds in the Avery, ride our turtle twister water slide, or simply relax by the lagoon. Plan your adventure today. Visit us online at www.turtle.ky. Hello, my name is Coco. I'm a Cayman Parrot at the Cayman Turtle Center. I was rescued and love my home here. Did you know our human friends at the center breed and raise Cayman Parrots? The national bird of the Cayman Islands? Then release them to live in the wild? Come visit me and my bird friends at Cayman Turtle Center. Did you know that turtles play an important role in ocean ecosystems? Turtles maintain healthy seagrass beds and coral reefs, providing key habitat for other marine life and helping to balance marine food webs and nutrient cycling. Learn more about our turtle friends at the Cayman Turtle Center. Okay, everyone, welcome back to the green scene here on Bobo 89.1 FM. I'm joined again with Geddes and Jane to talk to us a little bit about the Cayman Parrot and the conservation programs going on with them here in the Cayman Islands. Now, I know our team at the Cayman Turtle Center, our terrestrial department, and our aviary crew members have worked closely with the Department of Environment in the past with parrots that we have at the center. Right, Geddes? Yes. Uh, from, from early on, we've been, like I said, we've all, we're all interested in the same thing, which is the conservation of our national bird. And uh, you know, we've, we've done our best to help the DOE with everything that, we, everything that we could, using our expertise and our resources. Uh, we've helped rehab some birds. Like I said, it's not something that, we, that we're too eager to get into because there's a lot of work, but if it has to be done, we, we quite happily go ahead and do it. Uh, even to the point of, but these days we're more, in, we're more into the consulting, I would say. Uh, during the parrot amnesty, you know, we, we did go out with them a couple of times, but more in terms of helping them to identify, identify birds, uh, age groups, uh, sexes, uh, our work with the parrots, hands-on, has given us a lot of insights. As I said earlier, a lot of things we learned the hard way, but uh, it's really helpful out in the field when you can learn to identify a bird, uh, if, it's a, if it's a male, if it's a female, if it's a young bird, if it's an, if it's an older bird. Because in the cases, for example, if I could, I could mention, we have cases where people had mentioned that they had a bird for a long time, but, and we'd look at a picture, look at this bird, and we can tell it's, it's a young animal. There's no way you've had that bird since you've been however old. So things like that 
help with the conservation. It's a it's a form of where in situ or ex situ helps with in situ. You know, working with animals in captivity or on that human care can also help with management of species out the same species out in the wild. Because there are certain things you can do or learn from animals having animals close up like that that can help you translate to to management, the better management of wild, the wild populations. Yeah, I think uh, I agree 100%. And we've always been very uh, close in how we collaborate mm-hmm. about every single <laughs> case that comes in. And um, and I think one of the one of the areas that you helped in uh, the most that was the most beneficial in, in my during my time here, especially during Amnesty, was when we got our enforcement staff to come and, and do a hands on oh, yeah. training event with you all mm-hmm. because they get called out and uh, to to injured birds and that sort of thing. And historically, we are a marine department. So <laughs> and so these opportunities have not really been, you know, something that we locally could provide. But I think it's it's been great for the enforcement staff to be able to be told and, and hold a parrot in under control circumstances before uh, being by the side of the road or, or having to respond, you know, by themselves. So that was definitely one yeah. of one of the highlights for me of our collaboration so far. Um, but also just the knowledge of the the health and, and the welfare as we were setting up the, the sanctuary with Ron Hargrave, we went out and consulted with him about the, the size of the cages and and the height of the cages, the materials, um, making sure that parrots don't get poisoned if they got the wrong mesh and they chew on it and and yeah. all of those things. Yeah, things that we wish more people knew about it. Correct, yeah. They have birds <laughs> on their own. When he went out on the amnesty, I remember some of the situations I was cringing looking at how people kept these, these parrots. It was hard, yes. Intelligent birds, very active because they move if I could mention, they move in different dimensions. They don't just fly. They, they crawl up and down. They need height. Like for example, we always knew that height was more important than width when you're mm-hmm. considering a cage because parrots like to climb and they like to go up. So they always, they always tend to be at the highest point. So to see a parrot in a cage where it has to stay mm-hmm. practically bent over. In a rabbit cage, yeah. Just bent over all the time. You can just, all they can do is move from side to side. It's, it's really heartbreaking. So... Uh, I know during the amnesty, uh, Jen and I looked at some of the some of the basic protocols that we would want people owners to have to benefit. I mean, the, this is your national bird, and you, you have the privilege of not keeping it in captivity. There should be certain standards of care. We worked on putting those together to benefit to, to share with these parrot owners, and hopefully they follow them. Yeah, and maybe this is a good time to to mention to the listeners that the amnesty did close back in 2019, so you can no longer register your Cayman parrot. So we're talking about the sort of the historic event, as it were, and and how yeah, really get us. You helped a lot with sort of our protocols. We we try to give you know the parrot, the current parrot owners, the best knowledge inf- and and information available. And uh, so we put together husbandry brochures mm-hmm. and and everything, and also the permit states that you know the, the animals must be free from pain and suffering, mm-hmm. have access to fresh water and fresh food and clean clean cages, etc. So yeah, yeah. Because at the at the turtle center, we we like to think that we keep we, well, we keep the local gold standard for parrot care, and yes, those welfare protocols are very important. You know, uh, what Jane was referring to is part of what they call the five freedoms of welfare good welfare for these animals. And yes, parrots are highly intelligent. So you don't keep them right. They get depressed. They get, you know, they get sick, just like a normal person. Mm-hmm. Like anybody else that gets, that gets depressed or, or bad, kept mm-hmm. in bad conditions. And hopefully owners will understand that. And we still get calls of messages from the public asking about, about amnesty. So I know that, for example, we know there are people out there that probably, maybe one or two, not too many, that probably still don't have their parrots registered. But uh, I don't know, maybe you suggest, what do you suggest they do? So so one of the things that I want to mention here is that if, if anyone sees a parrot uh, in a cage that does not, a caiman parrot, I should say, not a macaw, and not a lovebird or anything else, but a caiman parrot, the green one, that does not have a leg band or a metal ring around its leg, then that is not a legal bird. So that is, that is not a bird that has been granted permission by the National uh, Conservation Council through the National Conservation Act. So I just want to let, let everyone know that... Um, and, and that those birds will will need to be rehabbed if possible and and released or um, kept out of out of private hands. Yeah, mm-hmm. I do just have two questions to touch upon points that both of you made. The first one, I'm sure, when most people are providing um, poor welfare to an animal, it's not 
for wanting to provide poor welfare. It's more so just from a lack of education and learning on the topic of what needs to be provided for an animal, especially like you were saying, it's like having a four-year-old kid. <laughs> well, <laughs> abs absolutely. And and I think the amnesty was uh, was really instrumental in that because every single household I went into, uh, with maybe one or two exceptions, I mean, you know, almost we registered 326 birds. So it was it was a lot of house calls and everyone was just so grateful to, to get the free vet veterinary service in their own home. You know, nobody had to take their parrot to us. We came to them and um, and to learn about what they can and can't be fed and and, you know, if they're doing well, if they're healthy weight, if they're too fat, too skinny, we would weigh the parrots. And, and you know, people care about their birds, rightly so. So, you know, it's, it's not to, to say it, it can't be done in captivity. It just takes, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of knowledge. And, mm -hmm. yeah. Is there somewhere if people have a registered parrot can find out how to provide proper welfare for them? Is there somewhere they can go? Yes, absolutely. On our webpage, um, doe.ky, we have the uh, animal brochure that we just talked about that Geddes and I put together. That is up there as a, as a resource. Mm -hmm. um, and usually the, the Cayman parrot owners, I should be in touch with all of them um, still. So so people also have either my personal number or, or the actual DOE office number and, and anyone's welcome to, to write and ask for, for any kind of specific care. Mm -hmm. And Cayman parrots are a protected species. So unless they've been registered directly with Department of Environment, it's illegal to have them. Correct, and yes. what would be the repercussions? Well, so at, at this point in time, we try to just get the parrots out of private hands and give them the best chance of, of being wild birds again. Mm -hmm. um, down the line, as the community and everybody understands better about the amnesty and what's happened and, and that we do have facility now through the parrot sanctuary to give these birds a better life, um, then you can become prosecuted, especially if you're robbing a nest and you're, you're caught in the act, as was the case. Um, in, in one or two years ago. So we do try and do protecting of nests, actual wild nests as well. So that's another um, conservation action that, that we've taken at the Department of Environment because it's just not sustainable to take these babies out of the wild. And you also said previously that you've rehabbed and released parrots. And I know our team at Cayman Turtle Center has helped you guys with a few of those as well. That's right. We <laughs> had the, the brats that came from the dark oh, yeah. nursery. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was a, that was a story. That Saturday morning, we got called. It, we had these parrots in the nest. A year <laughs> later, we had these. We raised these healthy animals and released them back into the wild. It was a, it was a really nice story. It was wonderful, and but I think you're skipping the part where we really tried everything to oh, yes. put them back into the wild and try. see if the mom and dad would come back. And we had yes, a bucket we, nest. We had all sorts yes, of nests. We tried all kinds of things to put that put those back. In those were hot days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's worth it. it's worth it. It's worth it if you have a passion for these, for these animals, especially for parrots. Every single yeah. one is worth yeah. it. I think you definitely realize when you're looking after it that amount of babies because it was three right right just how difficult it, it is for mm -hmm. the parents we yes. split them up in the beginning <laughs> didn't we, yeah, we split them up. <laughs> it's a lot of work eventually we figured the best place is just to keep them together and, and work with it you know it was and it worked out i think everybody got everybody got into it at first they were at first they were to be honest at first they were grumbling a little bit because no gosh we've got to rehab again but yeah they, they just kind of grew on us and like i said we called them the brats yeah and, they got a collective name and they got a collective name <laughs> and and yeah, they became part. Of, they became part of the family. And when were they released into the wild? Uh, they were released in September last, last year, year yeah. at the Botanic Park. So they joined that group of parrots that we released at the Botanic Park. Yeah. So even though they weren't born in captivity, we still considered part considered them part of our family because mm -hmm. or or parrot family. So that's what you guys are doing for the conservation of parrots. But what are some simple things that the everyday person can do to help make? The wild a little bit of a better place for parrots oh well definitely <laughs> uh, one thing is habitat uh, i want we want people to consider that the animal and its habitat is one because par like jane said the parrots don't do well flying through flying through electric lines and that kind of thing they don't live around the cities they need their own habitat they need space to, they need space not only to breathe but they need space to roam and live and I liken it to our everyday people, so your everyday life. So you live in one place, but everybody goes to a supermarket to get, their, to get their food. They go to somewhere else if they want their recreation. So they need space to be able to move around. And when you, when you destroy habitats or you, or you fragment habitat, you make it more difficult for these animals. And, they, you, know, and you put them under stresses that they don't need, and then they... They don't breed, as, they don't get to breed as well. 
And it'd be a shame because again, I'll refer back to, as I did earlier to Hurricane Ivan, just the sight of a Cayman parrot flying through, there mean, flying through the air means something to us because it's part of the identity of who we are. People come to the Cayman Islands to see Cayman parrots. And if you don't have a national, if you, it'd be a shame to have to switch a national bird just because it doesn't exist anymore. Put it kind of bluntly in extreme. Yeah, and I think another thing that you can do too is, especially after storms, you know, keep your eyes out in, in the low bushes and on the ground and for any kind of birds that have been injured and, mm -hmm. and obviously feel free to, to call the department if, if you ever do find an injured parrot. Um, but also during hurricane preparedness, you know, do those trees really have to go? A lot of people are, are very scared now, especially after grace and a lot of vegetation got cut down and, and some of it was not all necessary. So I think being mindful that, that those trees, although they may be dead, you know, they're still standing and they serve a purpose. I, I think people forget about that. And, and that's really very important nesting habitat. Um, and, and play an active role in, in conservation too. You know, if once we have terrestrial protected area nominations, um, rounds going, and you, you know of a parrot nest or anything else, you know, feel, feel free to get involved and contact the council with, with any kind of nominations. Um, go to the parrot sanctuary and, and the turtle center and see these birds up close. Try and, and get, to learn, get, get to know them and, and understand them and, and why they are so important to preserve in the wild. Uh, if I could add one more thing, uh, definitely, you can plant things. Uh, Jane mentioned that a lot of trees were, were cut down after the, after the hurricane, but I mean, we need to replace them. And let's try to use native species instead of this exotic things. You know, because these, these birds, every time you plant something, you know, you're introducing, and if you're gonna plant an exotic plant, you're introducing them in new to the environment that, that does not benefit the, our wildlife much anyway. So let's try planting more, more native fruit trees. You, know, go to the, you can go to the botanic park and get some native trees trees if you want something to plant in your yard, you might as well, because they're a lot more resilient. Use less water because they're already, they're already adapted to this environment, you know, and they're going to benefit everything in the long run. Now, we touched upon this a little bit earlier, but can we just remind the listeners why the conservation of caiman parrots is so important? Well, you know, do it from a, from a, socio a social perspective. Uh, it's our national icon. It's a part of our identity, just like the sea turtle. In the case of the Cayman Turtle Center, the sea turtle is part of our national identity, and so is a parrot. Like we say, it's, our, it's the original national flag carrier because all the colors of the flag are on display when the flag parrot is in flight. Uh, it's, the parrots were here long before. And if I can, if I may, one of the interesting things that I also came across is uh, some people might, into literature might know the, the book Treasure Island. That book, if I, if I remember right, was actually based on piracy in the Cayman Islands. Or at least, at least that was the inspiration for the, for the novel. And everybody knows that there was a parrot called Captain Flint. I think it was the name. It says pieces of eight, pieces of eight. So if this was a Cayman pirate, it goes to, to figure that maybe that was a Cayman parrot. You know, so it's, it's not only a part of our own culture, but it's part of international literature. You know? And again, on the other side, like I said, it's also it's part of our identity. It's part of who we are. It's part of our, our natural heritage. And people from around the world come here to to visit to see our natural heritage. And Jane, do you have any input there or did Geddes <laughs> sort of handle it all? <laughs> no, I, th I think, I mean, I think Geddes puts it very well. And, and as I mentioned earlier, when you do travel and, and see other natural areas, it's very rare that you see such a big and beautiful, colorful bird because they have, you know, very special requirements. And most parrots around the world are critically endangered, threatened or extinct. We've lost a lot of parrot species already around the Caribbean in nations that haven't um, been able to financially, um, you know, put uh, resources aside, such as a Department of Environment, um, you know, or the, the Turtle Center. So, so we are very fortunate in that we are one of the wealthier countries and we do have resources to look after our environment. And, and so we should be proud of that. You know, we should be proud of, of still having these birds and, and being able to look after them because if you, you can't look after nature, you know, I think as a, as a nation, if you don't, if you don't do that, it, it just says a lot, right? It's, it's part of who everyone is and, um, I think it's incredibly important. And, and I do think that COVID also helped people understand that a little bit more. It helped people slow down and appreciate uh, the nature around them. And if I'm not mistaken, we also have a really big celebration coming up for parrots. We have World Parrot Day coming up in this month, yeah. the end of this month. Yeah, May 31st. 31st yeah. yeah, we celebrate and celebrate parrots around the world. Right? I think the, I can't remember the name of the organization that started World Parrot Day, but it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's to, to draw attention to parrots and the plates and the plates of bird parrots around the world. 
And as I mentioned earlier in the Caribbean, we have 13 species or subspecies of Caribbean island, of Caribbean island parrots, all unique to their own islands and habitats. Yeah, they're pretty, and they're all considered, and I think as Jane mentioned earlier, they're all considered automatically endangered because of their finite, uh, their finite ranges. You know, they're, they're restricted to one island. As she said, one hurricane, maybe two, could, you could lose a species. I think that almost happened with the Puerto Rican parrot, didn't it? Yes, yeah, so absolutely. They, they had to spend millions of dollars, some in a situation we definitely don't want to be in, that we've been in with the blue iguana already. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and they have two aviaries now in Puerto Rico, both of which I've been lucky enough to visit. Oh. And um, yeah, in Rio Bajo, especially, that's the kind of uh, foresty one on the, on the West Coast. And, and they've spent, as I said, millions of dollars trying to bring the Puerto Rican parrot back from the brink of extinction. And so far, they've been successful, but hopefully, it's not a place that you know it's not a place we want to get to especially preserving genetic diversity too um so if if we can take a lesson from from anyone it should be from puerto rico yeah definitely and i think we'll just finish up by asking if anyone would want any education on perhaps parrots or maybe they like to volunteer with either of your programs how would they reach out or potentially get that information or get involved, Gettys. Yeah, well, at the Cayman Turtle Center, uh, we welcome volunteers all the time, not just for, for our parrots or, or all of our animal programs. Uh, so they can contact us through our website or you can email info at turtle.ky and just mention volunteering and we'd be happy to have them around. Uh, it's coming up to breeding season now for, for all the animals at the center and, out as, and which mirrors what goes on out in the wild. And, you know, gathering food, you know, dropping by fruits and so on, that, that helps us a lot because we try to, in our program, we try to, to give the animals as much natural feed as we can because we do feed them commercial diets, a zoo diet, and it's, they get 100% nutrition. But we believe that these animals were designed to eat their natural diet and there are nutrients out there that, that they require. Maybe things for their gut bacteria that's not in the commercial feed. So we try to give them as much of that natural food as we can. And yeah, if, People even driving by and they see a bunch of sea grapes that's not on somebody's property that they're gonna jump over the fence and grab, <laughs> you know, things like that. That, that we really welcome that kind of that kind of help. And I know probably at the sanctuary too, Jane. Very much so. So if you are living out east, so <laughs> Geddes could take all the help. He he needs this <laughs> side of the island. But if you're out east and you want to do the same thing, there's a sanctuary out there too. And and as I mentioned earlier, we have 19 birds in captivity at this point. Some are scheduled for release. Some are lifers, and uh, and definitely they love their the wild food as well. So wild food can be anything from uh, wild tamarind and sea grape, birch berries, mangoes. almonds, <laughs> mangoes, yeah, for, for a treat. Um, so so definitely that's something you can do. And, and yeah, just familiarize yourself with the bird. Visit the two places and, um, and yeah, enjoy them. Learn more about it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then Cayman Turtle Center is the only place with both species. Yes, I think so far as the only place in the world where you can see both of them side by side, which is very educational because actually there are we, most people in Cayman don't realize there are two national birds because officially, if you look on the government website, the national bird is the Cayman parrot, and there are two. Mm-hmm. Most people only think about the Grand Cayman parrot, but the Cayman black parrot is no less so. In fact, maybe some could argue it's even more special because it's... You could it's, say that, yeah. It is, it is <laughs> mm-hmm. the rarest of the Amazons. By the it's range. the most narrow range restricted Amazon in the world, yes. Yeah. 14 square miles, that's it. Well, every now and again, one or two of them visit little Cayman, but, but they fly yeah. back. Yes. And you can also hear the different calls we mentioned earlier. Yes. How they sound different, the two of them. Yes. That's how we first <laughs> figured out when we, when you rescue, when you got a couple of rescued brack parrots, they didn't look very, in very good condition. So we couldn't really tell what they were. We just thought it was small <laughs> grand Cayman parrots. And then when they got healthy again and they started to call, that's the first thing we noticed. Like, what, what is that? <laughs> that doesn't sound like our regular parrots. Like I said, all the things we learned, we learned the hard, well, not, not the hard way, but we learn by, by accident. You know, now, we can, now we can share that information with everybody else. We get over almost 2,000 school children in the past year every year. And it's really good to hear them say, you know, we ask them, well, which is the national bird? They say, and it's great to hear them say the Cayman Brack Parrot and the Grand Cayman Parrot. Mm-hmm. So we know the word is getting out. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, guys, on the green scene. Do you have any final words or maybe any key takeaways for any of our listeners today? Yeah, I would say that don't think of the Cayman parrot just as a Cayman parrot. Think of it as a symbol of our of our environment, okay? because just the fact that there are parrots there means that there's forest and or woodlands, and intact healthy woodlands mean intact 
mean healthy parrots. And that's, that's good for all of us. Even if you just want to think of it as, you know, the ability to take a walk through the woods and hear parrots calling in the background. You know, all this is, is good, not just for, your, for our, our mental health and our, our physical health, but also for our mental health. You know, so parrots go beyond just having a bird that's flying around places. You know, it, it benefits us on so many, so many levels. Yeah, I, I agree completely. And I think um, to, to look out for the Cayman parrots, you really have a great chance at this time of the year because we do have nesting season uh, mm -hmm. currently progressing. So if you do know of a wild parrot nest, please do keep looking mm -hmm. out for that for them. You know, if you see something, say something, because unfortunately there still is um, a bit of a local trade, illegal trade. These birds are protected at all times. So if you see anything, you can always call the enforcement staff at, at the DOE. I'm going to give a number now, which is 916-4271. Um, and that's the in enforcement at the Department of Environment. We, we will come out and uh, make sure that, that to the best of our ability, both parents and babies or eggs are safe. So do your bit and, and keep looking out. If you know of a parrot nest, just keep checking in that don't disturb it. Don't necessarily go and, and look inside, but watch from a distance and make sure that nothing has been cut open or, or pulled down or anything like that. Well, once again, thank you so much, you two, for joining us today. And thank I you. hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> it was wonderful. Thanks for having us. No problem. Yeah. And just a reminder, coming up this week at CTC, we have our keeper talks throughout the week, also including our Caribbean aviary, where during weekdays you can stop in there from 10 to 3 and learn more about our Cayman parrots. And on weekends from between 10 to 12 and 1 to 3, you can stop there and learn more about both the Grand Cayman and the Cayman Brack Parrot. And we also have nesting season that has begun at Cayman Turtle Center. So you can stop by and see our hatchery in full bloom right now, as well as maybe a few hatchlings. And if you want to volunteer, please reach out to info at turtle.ky for more information. Or perhaps if you want to volunteer with our parrots as well. And a top tip for you locals, if you want to save some money, especially at this time, you can get yourself an annual pass and enjoy unlimited access to the center all year round so you can come see our parrots as many times as you'd like during our open days throughout the year. So thank you everyone from, for tuning in on Bobo 89.1 FM from the Green Scene brought to you by Cayman Turtle Conservation and Education Center. Thank you for listening and we'll see you next time. You've been listening to the Green Scene hosted by Cayman Turtle Conservation and Education Center. Catch us every Saturday at 11 a.m. right here on Bobo 89.1 FM. We're inviting you to our new show. Welcome to Cayman Turtle Center. A day of fun and adventure awaits at Cayman Turtle Center Island Wildlife Encounter. Swim and snorkel alongside sea turtles and other marine life. Meet tropical birds in the Avery, ride a turtle twister water slide, or simply relax by the lagoon. Plan your adventure today. Visit us online at www.turtle.ky.